So, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, all the all the uh, participants for the panel discussion. And uh, and personally, uh, at least I've been quite passionate for some time now that uh, one should do something for the uh, cause of nursing or profession of nursing. And and we are all aware of the challenges, so we are not going to repeat that. But but just to summarize, I think what we all felt that we do have the challenge of the, let's say, the image which the nursing profession has in the society for that matter. We are talking about uh, inconsistent quality of nursing education. We are talking about poor compensation. We speak about work environment. We speak about uh, lack of willingness to invest in upskilling or training. Uh, we speak about lack of recognition. We don't have enough uh, nursing leadership. We don't have enough recognition. And finally, the regulatory framework uh, for the nursing profession uh, is, is also something which is not favorable. So I think we are aware of the challenges. And we and it, we are we are privileged to have some of the veterans in the country. I mean, some of the veterans as in uh, physicians uh, uh, who have been very successful practitioners and also leaders in the organization they manage or they run for that matter. So we have Dr. Avita who runs Fernandez uh, Foundation, which has uh, quite a few hospitals and a very well-known name. We have Dr. Jairam, uh, who used to be the chairman and group medical director for Columbia Asia Hospital for many, many years. Now is the chairman at Medica Synergy. We have Dr. Sajjan, uh, who is the chief executive at Zaida's group of hospitals. Then uh, Dr. Sanjeev, who was heading uh, Amrita Hospital in, in Cochin and now in Faradabad. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Vijay Agarwal, who played a very pivotal role in setting up Max in its initial days and now is the president at Kaho. And uh, we have somebody who's going to be on my side, uh, Captain Najita, and she represents, uh, as the president of ANEI, the nursing profession. So I think that's the group we have. And what we felt that in, in today's panel discussion, let's look at let's look at life, if I may say, from the doctor's leader's perspective. And why I'm saying is that somewhere there is a belief, and I'm just saying uh, I, I get to hear about it very often, that most of the physicians, you know, whether they are practicing or they are responsible in uh, running an organization for that matter. Um, either ignore the nursing profession or let's say don't do enough for the nursing profession. Okay, and and uh, and that's a world view, and and I would imagine, uh, I think the frequency with which I've heard that and the intensity which which I've heard that people even talk about at times that they almost play at times and a, a role which is quite hostile to the profession. So so I'm not getting into that. Uh, judgment of the perspective, but I just thought that let's let's at least get uh, perspectives or the views of some of the some of the senior uh, leaders. You know, when it comes to various challenges in the nursing profession. So the way I the way we're going to go about it is that I have a few uh, questions, and I would address uh, each of the questions, and maybe two or three of you, because we may not have the time to. I have all of you answer the same set of questions, but please feel free to intervene. So my first question is that nurses are pushed into subordination and are reduced to the role of, let me use the word, order takers from the doctors. The problem may have got further aggravated, as Captain Najita almost often says, because of gender issues. What is it the senior physicians should do or have done to address this enormous inequality. Let me start with uh, Dr. Jairam. Thank you, Ratan, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure, privilege to be here in the midst of all the others in the panel. And uh, yes, coming to your question, Ratan, your question is perhaps addressed best by considering A, is there gender inequality between uh, the nurses and doctors and therefore uh, a kind of discrimination of nurses? 
B, why are nurses in that social hierarchy? Let me take the gender question first. I don't believe that it is really gender related because in today's world, two things are happening. Number one, more and more physicians are women and proudly at that. And this therefore will change with time and the gender inequality amongst physicians will disappear. Again, amongst the nurses, and I'm sure you will agree, while there is predominantly women in the nursing profession, there are a smaller percentage of men who also take up nursing and who are very important there for obvious reasons. So I don't think gender is the reason, but then why is this the situation? This situation, I would say, is historical. From the time medicine was practiced, in this country at least, there was a social hierarchy established where the doctor was considered the god and then everybody else, mere mortals, below him. And how can we change this? It is definitely a requirement to do this from a both top-down and bottom-up way. I don't think it is possible for one single person or a physician to really make the change. But I think the change has to come from both sides. Now, how do we do that? Clearly, an attitude amongst the physicians to ensure that they do the following. A, participate in nurse training. B, socialize with nursing in various ways in order to enable nurses to interact, converse, and increase the communication between the physicians and themselves. Partake in their training and skill development, which is a part and parcel, obviously, of any profession. And the extent to which the physician can really contribute is enormous. And also to ensure that they identify stars in the nursing team that works with them and enable these stars to move up the ladder and get take up positions of responsibility, which will enable better positioning of the nurse. I would also say this is this has to go in parallel with the attitude of the institution, which the physician can really affect. The physician can, by virtue of his position in the institution, create the necessary environment for the operational leaders, the CEOs and the managing directors, to ensure that whatever is stated is followed. And that, I believe, would create a slow but sure way of moving the nurses up the social ladder. Back to you, Rabbi. Dr. Vita, what is your take on this inequality and what, what can be done and what has been done? Thank you, Ratan. Thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, Dr. Jairam has actually enumerated a lot of very, very relevant things. And thank you for setting the ground for us. Um, Apart from reiterating what he said, I would say, you know, keep in mind that majority of the nurses today, nearly every nurse comes from a very humble background and they've not had the opportunities that most of us have had as doctors and living in the city. So to build up confidence in this cadre, I agree, it has to start uh, with a change in mindset from the physician community, the doctors. So while we start from the leadership, also bottom up, it has to work both ways because there's such a strong hierarchy. How do you build confidence in these nurses? One, to improve their skills. So in-service training is something we believe in very, very much. And as has been said, identify the spark in some of them and get them to fly and develop leadership, give them more responsibilities. The other aspect I feel very strongly about is the accommodation that we give them, the type of accommodation. You know, uh, at least in Fernandez, where it's food and an accommodation is free. They don't pay for that. And make sure that we are paying them salaries that are more than just living wages. Um, invest in building up confidence by investing in English class. And now we've got groups of them. We're working with an NGO called Voice for Girls. 
and developing also the soft skills. While we are developing their knowledge clinically, we're also giving them these soft skills of, you know, how do you talk? How do you, uh, how do you negotiate? How do you not cow down when you're in the right? It's a continuous process, but it has to begin with the fact that as an organization, we believe that nurses are not gophers, not second-class citizens, but colleagues. And I agree with Dr. Jairam, getting them into leadership positions, being involved in policy decisions is a way of establishing that. Thank you. So I think what we are talking about is the kind of background they come from uh, is not very uh, unexpected that they may not have the, the necessary confidence, particularly in relation to what we see from the doctor community for that matter. And to that extent, you know, I'm just saying whether you talk about skilling in terms of communication or language could certainly be one important piece. Identifying bright sparks among the younger ones uh, is another possibility. We spoke about uh, socializing in some fashion. Mm -hmm. And one thing, again, uh, I think I've heard from some of the nursing leaders is a very insightful manifestation and what I'm told is that in a hospital setting where the chief nursing officer is made to report to the chief medical officer or the medical director, you have institutionalized subordination. So, in fact, and that's something uh, Dr. Jairam, uh, Colonel Binu used to tell me all the time, that, that the only way you can make it appear parallel, you know, I'm just saying visibly and otherwise, is have both of them report to the same person, whether it is the CEO or the chairman or the managing director, whoever it is. So I think that's something which which have been, and 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 I'm just saying, what would you say that to uh, Captain Ajita? This whole phenomenon of the chief nursing officer being made, and I'm using the word being made to report to the medical director. Um, traditionally, that had been the fashion, but of late, uh, this had been changed. Uh, so for uh, for half of my uh, professional life of uh, around 35 years, uh, I had been in private sector. In government, it is totally different where the nurses report to doctor bosses, and that is how it is across the country, be it in armed forces, be it railways, be it uh, state governments or central governments. But coming to the private sector, yeah, you see all shades and colors. So a couple of places I had been reporting to medical superintendents uh, and later it had been changed. I'm sure they were very happy to uh, change that role to the uh, you know CEOs or, or who heads the organization. So we, we do find a lot of shades and colors. But however, uh, the idea of reporting to a medical head obviously uh, means to the public or to the employees is that... Uh, it is something, you know, assistive function. Okay, so let us accept that. Uh, but when the moment you start reporting to the head of the hospital, it somehow communicates uh, to the people or to the nurses themselves that, uh, you know, we are probably given more responsibility and accountability. And that is in a way of accepting uh, their role as, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say independent role, but however, they have their set of, uh, you know, responsibilities and accountabilities. So um, usually what happens is that if, if a nurse head reports to a uh, physician, uh, a medical superintendent, let's say that role, uh, or a medical director, it, it in a way means unless that person is the head of the hospital, it okay. means that, you know, something, uh, they are answerable to them. You know, for everything. Uh, so the responsibilities doesn't change in either way, but it is the attitude. It is the way it is being exactly. perceived. You know, I personally haven't felt that way uh, because I, I knew uh, how to get my job done or how to get, get my voice heard. But then that is a very, very minority of the yeah. nursing heads, you know. so That's what I'm told. I think it does yeah. make it. Yes. So it depends on the person. But by and large, when you consider uh, the usual type of uh, nurse leaders, it is always, uh, you know, if you have to be pro-nursing, you have to be reporting to the hospital head because of the hope that they will take a, 
you know neutral uh, way of looking at things and not you know really biased to the doctors uh, mm -hmm. though it it happens still okay it does happen because uh, because the private sector the the end their uh, private sector business depends on the doctors so uh, you know uh, leaning or bias towards the doctors is quite natural it will happen but however um, if the head of the hospital takes a neutral role that is lot more supporting but again i would i would also like to say that it it lot depends on the uh, the person's quality the the nurse heads uh, you know view at things and how they reciprocate and respond to situations how do they give confidence to their uh, you know uh, the the files the the people at the front uh, the the nurses who who do take care of the patients so how do we support them is what matters uh, and as a whole it's not only the nurse head how the hospital responds towards the nurses uh, so on a usual day everything goes fine but when when situations happens uh, you know one small thing what should be done in every hospital which i have felt uh, is is you know the the prohibition of doctors shouting at nurses you know it, it is it is this this uh, nurse abuse uh, if i may call it that way is so uh, rampant in hospitals that you know doctors don't have to think twice to raise at the nurse you know they they really feel that it's their birthright to do so uh, so in some hospitals i have worked it was uh, it was from the head of the hospital it was banned okay and and that particular hospital had a physician head uh, you know a doctor head so uh, you know and and i was also told that no i don't want to hear your high pitch of voice here you know in my interview it was told so but i felt in that hospital nurses had uh, you know little more autonomy than in the other places like they used to decide e even the place i work currently is that nurses do have a lot of voices but then it is you know it is a mix of things when you give that responsibility or or that position to the nurses they also should know how to you know utilize it and you know raise the flag when it is required uh, you know things like that so it is it is sort of both ways i would say that the resultant situation is is a is a collective responsibility it is not only you the nurse head can fight for it not really so but whenever we we should we must but otherwise you know everybody has to work for it and the advantage is that you know in such uh, such places uh, the patient care is safer let me put it that way if you give this accountability and respect to the nurses i'm sure the patients will be taken care better and thereby uh, reducing many of our kpis negative kpis uh, and uh, incidentally the mortality rate even comes down i mean anyone yeah, can experience this and see absolutely and i think one of the point with dr ajita you mentioned that is so important in a hospital setting to make it amply clear what is a non acceptable behavior from the physician make it explicit yes no and it can't be and you have to set examples and and in case you have to identify uh, some of the aberrations and take adequate action you know then you don't get to a tolerant and an understanding mode and i think that's a this is a very important uh, uh, way to demonstrate that you do believe in what you say i think that's important now the second question coming to the role of a typical nurse i think what i have seen myself i've been a patient in a hospital more than once and the role of a nurse is very very muddled up i'm just i'm just saying she's the one who will follow up with gda with the housekeeping with the fnb if the television is not working with the pharmacy i'm just saying i think she is the principal follow up officer then she does a whole lot of data entry and i think whatever time is left is what goes to patient care so i think and i'm just saying that i mean dr sarjan was talking about let's say when you have a nabh accreditation when you have such events then everything pretty much boils down to the nurse i think it's such a scenario where she is almost always afraid of getting blamed for something not going right for no fault of hers it does lead to a humongous amount of stress it leads to you know poor care for that matter it leads to like you said uh, abuse or bullying for that matter she is under constant stress so my question is as physician leaders 
what is it what has been your experience what is it which you have done or can be done to to address the the very weird role for that matter which they have been gifted with so let me start with uh, dr vijay so oh, thank you anurag ji very very interesting discussion going on and uh, and i must say that uh, over a period of time the uh, positioning of the nursing profession is definitely improving but i think it is far far from satisfactory and there are many many reasons for it and i think one of the things would be that we need to have such symposiums and webinars for the clinicians in fact as to uh, how do they shed off their arrogant shameful behavior see what happens that we can talk about it in the nursing forum we can give them a lot of lip sympathy we can uh, be extremely empathetic to them but you know the things continue to behave or they continue to work and behave the same way now there are many factors to it one as we uh, said doctor i think dr jaram said that what has been the tradition hierarchical etc etc all that needs to change now in that another factor which has to be kept in mind i would say somewhere which plays a role is somewhere the intellectual asymmetry that we need to address and that's where because a lot of these nurses are coming from very humble background how do you empower them to voice uh, whatever they feel what whatever is right and so it's a i'll say that today what you can see is that lot of nursing leaders have gotten in lot of uh, big hospitals etc they have gotten some reasonable place i will say uh, of, of a kind of a position some of them have even become the ceos of the of the hospital but that's extremely uncommon the thing is that let us look at what is the position of a nurse who is entering the profession i think the problem is lying at that level that our nursing education our nursing system of even we are not able to i think attract a good kind of students there for the students for example they don't think of nursing as a uh, kind of a possible alternative it comes way down in their list of if if they have to make a choice then it is i think way down and the reason for that is that we are not working to build up the public perception of the nursing profession yeah. you look at the number of people who have obtained padam shrees and padam vibhushans tell me that how many nurses have gotten it okay so if there are 12 13 of the doctors doctors every time will uh, get something uh, because they are the ones who are coming and not because that they the only thing is that they treated the vips and at that stage uh, the nurses were not getting that kind of a visibility but the issue is this that uh, there is a public perception of that level so somewhere along the line i think in the nursing curriculum emphasis on uh, learning about communication uh, and learning about grooming learning about the importance of how you are carrying yourself etc are extremely important it really is painful that the uh, nursing when and especially i will say the at, at the entrance level their system is i mean is extremely extremely pathetic i get that i get that uh, dr sajan what's your view on the role the uh, good afternoon sir uh, ajita was very passionate and so were all the speakers so uh just to let you know zydas has got nursing head reporting to the ceo in all the hospitals so that sorts out one issue and uh, broadly one thing which uh, i would like to say is i look at nursing as and this is my experience whatever little experience i have i look at two broad categories of nurses less than 5 years of experience and more than 5 years of experience so this less than 5 year of experience nurses uh obviously they are not trained they come with small uh, small small uh, teaching colleges nursing colleges i don't know who is looking at it i would not say much on that 
and suddenly they are brought up into the big sea, big ocean, and right in the line of the fire. Uh, kudos to them that they take the guts to come into that. But more importantly, if you look, it's like our MBBS. We were, what, 21, 22? We never knew what to do after that. And same thing is with these kids. 20, 21 of years, nothing, no, nothing about the world. And suddenly, so many new faces, new rules, new systems, and obviously patients. Now, that's where everything uh, becomes, they're absolutely in an alien environment. That's the first thing, what we see with the less than five years of experience. Second is the accreditation. Right? We have been talking about quality and all those things. Uh, accreditation, I see as a boon as well as a bane. Uh, whenever an accreditation happens or whatever SSS come, I've been part of an NABH SSF, the brunt is faced by these kids, both internally as well as externally. Honestly, I am on a pl pl platform, but I have not seen many SSS taking up the surgeons. The questions are always sent to the nurses, right? And this is very honest. Uh, and they have to bear the brand. So already they are gone down. Third band, they are the last man standing. Already we have this problem of attrition, which is happening all the time. We are all less of nurses. We talk about 90 day induction, six months settling down, body program, nothing happens. The moment they come in, they are right in 15 days, they are facing the, and these actual things which I've seen, they are right handling the patient. Uh, imagine 21 year old, fresh out of the college, handling the patients. Above five years of experience, I, I think more of, most of them get settled down, but they have got a different type of challenges. They know where they are. Somewhere I see between this, they have to be in the sort of four or five people running the hospital. So that's where nurse leadership comes. They have to be in the good books of the people to grow further or have a plan. So there's a different challenge from there. In India, it's very, very difficult to get objectivity, honestly. And we are very emotional guys. So all these things come here left and right. What I see, what we can do from my, uh, this thing is, first, have you ever seen an HR nurse, a nurse working in HR department? We have never seen that. So what we, wonder what we have done is we have taken two nursing in the HR department. If you look back into the HR department of any, any institute, I don't have a, I have some idea. Most of them are coming from a BCom or BA background. Most of them, not. So that means the last time they read science was in 10th standard, right? And they are handling the HR department of the hospital where the nursing is a very technical subject, whatever you say or not. And they are leading the test. So first thing you can do, what we have done is we have taken a, two people of the nursing order who are qualified in nature and they are part of the whole process. Second thing which we have done as of now we are trying to do is we are looking at a happiness index. And that's something which we have launched last one year where we look at the happiness index and where they are going. Rest of the other things, hand holding and all these things has to be led by the nurse leadership where they put their foot down in the meetings and say, this is what I need. Unfortunately, like Ajita was saying, they are, they are always, the numbers are cut at the nursing level, not at any other level. So we have got three things we can do. We can look at the HR way of functioning, get more nurses into the thing. Second, we have got a proper system of evaluating and getting them settling down. And third, we can objectively look at the things and make them grow. So thanks That's all lot. for me. No, thanks a lot. And I think the kind of stuff which you spoke about, the very fact that nursing happens to be one of the largest workforce I think it's it's so insightful to have one or two of them with some background into the HR function for that matter. So there is somebody who is able to look at life from their perspective. And and something as, honestly, if you want to do it, something as simple as, let's say, getting a sense of happiness index among them. I mean, that's one way to, let's say, constantly calibrate or monitor, let's say, the happiness level or the stress level. So I think that's an amazing, amazing thought. Now, the next I have is, See, again, uh, I think on practically every platform, when you talk about nursing, one says that there's a lot which is possible with investment and training. And if, if, you, if you're willing to invest in training, it can do a lot to uh, upgrade their skills, to elevate their position, you know, give them much better job satisfaction. You're talking about much higher compensation levels. There's a lot which is possible. And, and it has to do with, obviously, I'm just saying I'm not talking about managerial skill, but it has a lot to do with a different set of clinical skills for that matter, competence and skills. 
Now, that is one area where, I mean, someone like Dr. Vita has obviously, uh, I would say, completely changed the rule of the game by, by being the most vocal proponent of midwifery in the country. And, you know, and creating a very different uh, league of nurses, if I may say. So let me start with you. What is it which, uh, which drove you to that? And even before that, you know, I'm just saying, what was your take on uh, investment in training uh, so far as the nurses are concerned? Uh, thank you, Ratan. Um, you know, I grew up in an environment as an undergrad, postgrad, uh, this whole hierarchy, nurses being treated badly. But when I had the opportunity to go to the UK and work there for a little more than a year, I realized how important you know it is to treat colleagues at different levels with respect and and to and to invest in training. And when I sort of came back and took over and I realized, in the early years of my leadership, I didn't, I wasn't aware of this. But the more I began to think about, I realized that when you invest in training, uh, the first thing that hit us was their self-esteem just improves, the confidence. Now let's just fast forward because in-service training became uh, an integral part of our work. When I realized uh, after about two decades of being an obstetrician, that what we were doing was not really the right thing. We were not woman-centered. And my interest in midwifery made me realize we need a separate cadre to work along with obstetricians as colleagues. We complement each other because we are, have only one common focus. How can we make pregnancy and childbirth, not just safety, safety is a given, but how can we make that the most significant event for that woman? So when you think of it that way, put the woman and the child center, then you need to work with midwives. The more I researched on midwifery, I realized that we obstetricians had to step back, get the midwifery cadre in to take care of 40 to 50% of mothers who are healthy who don't need to be in obstetric care. So when you have a good cadre of midwives trained to global standards, which you are responsible for, for their training, then we doctors are given the freedom and more time to focus on what we are trained to do. The high-risk mothers, we, we, we are trained to do a safe cesarean. We're trained to do good instrumental births. We're trained to help the midwives when they call us and may help them make that decision. Yes, this woman needs to be referred into the theater. And the whole environment changes. You're getting better care being offered to mothers. And at the end of the day, mothers are happier. Your outcome for babies is better. Your need for admission into neonatal intensive care unit decreases. But all of this has to be coupled with a good salary structure and a career path for the midwives. I have never looked back on this, Rath, and I feel all of us who are privileged to be in leadership positions need to invest in training. I know some of them will leave you and go. In fact, quite a few of our midwives have gone to other cities because of marriage or have gone to the Middle East. Some have gone to Canada where they're working as midwives. Well, that's part of the game. Mm -hmm. But I feel investing in training is important. No, very right. In fact, somebody said, when you talk about investment in training, somebody said, what if you invest and then they go? And the answer to that was, what if you don't invest and then stay back? Yes. Um, does it help anyway? Yes. So coming to you, Sanjeev, on this thing about investing in training, what is it? Uh, which has been your experience, what are the kind of initiatives which, let's say, you have taken at Amrita? What has been the result? What has been some of the challenges? Yeah, thank you, Ratanji, and uh, fantastic to hear uh, such brilliant uh, insights from all the champions in the healthcare. I think it is very important, uh, you're asking very important question. Um, I personally feel, believe that there is 
uh, a, a change which is happening. Like if you look at a doctor post MBBS, he did his uh, MD medicine. Then he does, does his DM pediatric cardiology. He goes for a fellowship for electrophysiology in Boston. And then he comes back and he sets up an exclusive pediatric cardiac setup. Now, parallelly, you look at nursing. The nursing has come out of BSc, post basic, or maybe some MSc. They and there is none of the super specialized setup which is providing a similar kind of training. They have not gone abroad or and have come back. So there is when we start a specialized service and most of the hospitals in the tertiary care in metros are at quaternary care uh, services be, which are being provided so there is this dichotomy of a doctor who's so exclusively trained demanding very high end service because he has seen that and to save his neonate uh, with a congenital heart disease he needs that kind of a, a experience and training and there is none which is existing. And that is where the demand and the supply gap begins. And it is there where the leaders who should basically help the nursing to live up to those expectations because the continuous nursing training is extremely important. Unfortunately, many times the leaders would also have misplaced priorities. They would have, it will be very reactive and they would not follow a model, but on a day-to-day -day basis and not make it psychologically or otherwise safe for the, for the nursing to sort of adopt. The other point which I wanted to make is that training, training and training is important though, but I personally think that it is not helping. We have to link training to behavioral change. Now, we had used an ethnographic tool, which is sociogram, where we shadowed nursing and shadowed doctors when they go on round. Ours is a university teaching hospital. And then yet, our post 25 years of its existing, which is not for profit, the rounds are hierarchical in nature. The nursing rounds are also hierarchical in nature. And we are not able to break that because that's how the most of the communication happens between them. The senior communicates, the rest of the people don't participate. And it's the communication also is happening mostly to the carer and less to the patient. So it could be a patient centricity concept, but unfortunately in India, it's a carer and a patient centric hospital. So when we are training them with hierarchy, which exists, it is important to keep changing the behavior. So when we rounded, shadowed them, we drew all the diagram of communication. This is how you behaved. We went back to the nursing leader. We went back to the clinical service leader and said that this is how you communicated. All of them, both the nursing and the clinical leaders believed that they are the God's gift to mankind and the superb communicator. And when they saw that how they, they behave and communicate, the things have started changing. So training is important. Everybody is investing in training. There's induction, there's in-service, there are many, but it has to somehow get linked to um, behavioral change. And their participation onto a larger role, like <clears throat> they need to just own up. Like we have a something called as utilization review, where inappropriate stray, inappropriate pharmaceuticals, inappropriate diagnostics, inappropriate procedures are all reviewed by nurse. But she's so good because she's so grounded and she knows all what needs to be done that it cannot be always all procedures be clinic, clinician driven or clinician heavy. Similarly, lots of stewardship program, whether it is dietary, antimicrobial, whether it is safe, rational practices, for us, all is run by nursing leaders, nurses, and they communicate and we empower them. They communicate directly to the solid organ transplantation surgeon and give recommendation. And they communicate directly to cardiovascular thoracic surgeons and give recommendation. So I think training with behavioral change, with a lot of uh, skill building, competency setting up, 
and skill matrix improvement with empowerment of taking a higher role and uh, delivering at the bedside and at the boardroom would be a, a comprehensive way to look at it. No, I think you said it very, very comprehensive. Sir, if I, I can come in, I absolutely well said, Sanjeev. Sorry. But I just want to point out two things. One, uh, what uh, Dr. Sanjeev was saying, we have got no innovation in nursing role as such. It's the same old role rounds, taking, following up with the leaders and everything. That's one point and that we need to look at it, how we do it. Second thing, we, uh, the in charges, team leaders, all these designations happen by the experience, right? We have not seen any structured program for any nursing candidate to learn management. There are a lot of management issues which they don't understand. Maybe we will make it more strengthened if they go through a proper structured program of nursing. We have got all these short-term MBAs for managers, coordinators and all those things. But unless we have got a good program, which we run across the country, where we give all elements from right from HR to finance to marketing, everything to the nurse, they have a better understanding and they can become much better leaders. Unfortunately, none of the institutes or anything. We are sending two of them for a short-term program to IM. That's a different thing. But we don't have a whole structured program where many of the nurses can be taken and somebody can lead the initiative. Say a one-year program or a, something like that. Just my two points. And so, I also button for a minute, Ratan? Please, please. So I think, again, uh, Sanjeev, you raised a very important point, and that is that uh, there is a lack of specialization in today's date of the super specialization where we are. And the fact is that uh, it's not uncommon to see that a neonatal is, nurse is being pulled into the ICU and the ICU nurse is being sent into ophthalmology. And, you know, as if they are, uh, you know, you, you don't see a send an ophthalmologist doctor into some other ward boss that go and uh, do that work there. But it is so common to see this. And uh, this is a huge cause of heartburn but again, if we come into, and let me now put up the administrator's role, the issue is this, that you are uh, short of nurses, you are uh, needing to provide some nurse at some station, how do you do it? Overall, the economics of the hospital has to be addressed. And when we are addressing the economics of the hospital, I must say that the most shameful thing has been that we have not been able to address the issue of a decent salary to a nurse. Mm -hmm. Unless we do that, we are not going to change the image of this particular profession. That's very important. We need to have enough number of uh, nurses to be available. Now, there is a huge amount of uh, you know, problem in terms of a, whether the hospital should staff itself for its full capacity, for 80% capacity, for 50% capacity. I mean, there is a huge amount of variability. And then on top of that, you have these government schemes who are trying to not even pay you for the uh, even the basic cost of a procedure. So somewhere along the line, I think uh, the economics of the healthcare of the hospitals is playing a huge role. And somewhere, I think giving at least uh, uh, we, we should start labeling some nurses in every specialty like neonatal or in the ICU, etc., that they should not be changeable. You should allow them to be there. You can keep now some nurses who could be trained for more, uh, you know, general type of or support kind of services, because otherwise this act itself is leading to a lot of patient safety issues. So I think, Dr. Vijay, good that you 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 brought it up, and that was my next question. That I think it's so commonplace to say, and it gets talked about all the time. The nurses are paid peanuts. I'm just saying, an experienced nurse could, would even get less than maybe what a driver gets in a hospital. I'm just saying. Now that being the reality, defense cannot be because. They happen to be the largest workforce. If you tinker around their salary, it's going to mean so much for the hospital, profitability, bottom line, and all of that. You can't look at, let's say, nurses' compensation, which is so deep. I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, people don't hesitate when it comes to physician compensation for that matter. I'm talking about a 
big picture level scenario. I'm just saying we keep on talking about it all the time. But if we were to do something about nurses' compensation, make it little more respectable than what it currently is, Honestly, as physician leaders, what is that one or two things which should be done or have been done? Let me start with you, Dr. Jaira. Right. <clears throat> so this has been debated by us, at least in Columbia Asia, since significantly over the years. And let's accept one fact. Manpower cost is something that every CEO or managing director would be worried about. So... The answer to your question lies in one thing, and that is to increase the revenues from the nursing side. You know, what activities the nurses perform needs to have revenues, and that can be passed on to the nurses. If we fail to do this, then we will get into a spiral, which will never work. Honestly, today, if you ask any, any hospital, the desire to compensate nurses better is there. But the failure to do that is because of the requirement that their bottom line needs to look good for their investors, for their shareholders, and so on in the private sector. Which is why today you find that in the government service, the compensations for nurses are much better than it is in the private sector. So in the private sector, the only way we can do that is by increasing revenues. I understand this would add to costs, but may I say it is a necessary evil. Dr. Sajan? I disagree with this driver thing, honestly. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, that is absolutely not true, actually. Yes, there is a difference in the salaries. The initial salaries are not good because they are still come out of the hospital. But for that matter, any MBBS they also get the same amount of salary, if not much, right? Uh, or anybody else. But over a period of time, five years, six years down, they are getting decently good salaries. Somewhere we have created this narrative across. Two narratives which we have created in this country, I don't agree to those. Both the narratives is one is the word poor nursing or something, which I absolutely abhor using the word. And somewhere we are talking about uh, the salaries. My charges are who have worked with me seven to eight years are getting as good as salaries as some of the registrars who are working, right? The registrars has to go out and work more, but if on a duty to duty level, they are happy and they're quite de getting decently good salary. As coming to the initial nurses, there's a lot of training involved. I'm not saying, and we have to provide a lot of things to get them up to the level. What happens, what I see as a positive after three to four years working in a corporate, they get much better jobs in other hospitals. And I'm okay with that. So overall, if you ask me, no, the scene is not as bleak as it is. And we can do our own bit at our hospitals. Luckily, I'm not a PE funded or a private venture hospital. So I don't have to worry much about my bottom line or top line. That's the only solace I have. So we can have our own uh, parts. Yes, the attrition has been there on the junior nurses, but at the senior level, we have got almost zero attrition. So that somehow we have managed our own things. About the other people, other other hospitals, I don't know. I can talk about mine only. Thank you. Dr. Ajita, I mean, Captain Ajita. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we do find uh, like this pockets of excellence as uh, Dr. Sajan says, you know, each one, uh, you know, tries to fight it out themselves. But when we look at uh, a larger perspective across the country, uh, we have to agree to this fact that nurses have been paid very, very less. And look at look at the corporate hospitals where uh, where the profitability of the hospital is at stake all the time or questioned. Uh, the the salaries have been very very uh, you know meager and uh, not an acceptable level. So I am talking in general across the country. Okay, so um, I guess today the uh, the salaries as uh, stipulated by the government, the minimum wages is highest in Kerala. Uh, it starts with about 25,000. So any nurse who is, and and some of our hospitals have gone even beyond that, you know, not even the the uh, minimum wages because uh, they do it because nurses are not available. You have to run the hospital out of compulsion, they do. So some of the hospitals have gone ahead and, uh, you know, their 
మినిమం వేజ్ ఈస్ ట్వంటీ ఎయిట్ థౌసండ్ సో ఓకే సో అండ్ ఈస్ దాట్ ఎ గ్రేట్ సాలరీ ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ ఓకే యాజ్ అగేన్స్ట్ ద గవర్నమెంట్ సాలరీ ఆఫ్ యూనో ఫిఫ్టీ టు సిక్స్టీ థౌసండ్ పర్ మంత్ సో ద ద ఓన్లీ వే టు రీస్టోర్ సమ్ ఆఫ్ దేర్ రెస్పెక్టబిలిటీ జనరలీ అమంగ్ ద పబ్లిక్ ఈస్ టు రైస్ దేర్ సాలరీస్ బట్ దెన్ వీ డోంట్ హ్యావ్ మ్యాజిక్ టు దిస్ సో వాట్ ఐ ఫీల్ పర్సనలీ ఈస్ is that healthcare is a is a basic human right isn't it so uh, same like education so in education we have uh, the support of the government like in private sector like the salaries of the teachers is borne by the government uh, similar way when we provide healthcare which otherwise the government should have been doing it uh, 80% of 70 to 80% of healthcare is been provided by private sector in our country and uh, where there is absolutely no contribution of government you know so uh, to increase this i mean do, can we charge the patient anything more uh, we are not in a position to do that i tell you i mean the natural increase is there but then you can't exorbitantly today uh, charge the patient uh, it again varies from hospital to hospital but still healthcare costs are at at uh, you know whopping high you know which people can't afford and if we have to charge the patient more in order to give more salary to the nurses i don't think that is a workable formula so uh, when we uh, talk about our nation at large we have to have uh, you know some way of uh, support coming to the private sector to increase the salary of nurses otherwise uh, it is and and uh, we can argue that why is it high for some doctors i would say that it is minuscule of doctors and not the majority of doctors Uh, except that yes uh, doctors do command uh, you know some social status yes it is there but uh, otherwise majority of the doctors you know we, we are only talking about very few all the time uh, which is not the case either uh, so to increase the salary of nurses we have to find ways and means and uh, it is it is like everybody has to participate in that to to have constructive suggestion as to how do we go about Uh, because healthcare being a state subject and uh, uh, you know private health healthcare all the more you know somebody cannot just suggest but many people sitting together and having a larger framework to uh, discuss how to generate money in healthcare to in order to uh, improve the nurses salary is is actually the answer to the question what we are asking if we have to say save the nurses in our country we better pay them more because otherwise they are willing to go to the places where they are paid better you know we can't blame anybody for going away from this country it is in search of definitely for more salary and also for more respectability and social status so we are uh, not able to provide any of these things is the reason for uh, you know the the status of nursing in our country and and i i wouldn't hesitate to say that there are definitely pockets of excellence where nurses do enjoy uh, you know the treatment from the doctors as colleagues say cmc for example uh, you know i felt i did my pg at uh, uh, cmc velour and i felt that nurses are much more powerful than doctors there uh, you know this is about uh, 25 years ago i am talking about uh, so it it varies from uh, but i don't have another institution say that in that manner so we have to create a situation where they are paid better they are respected better they are participating in uh the healthcare delivery as a whole they have a say in the boardroom and things like that so it is it's an overall package it is not just one aspect of it no so thank you so much and i think sorry yeah dr vijay uh, so i'll say that <clears throat> we need to kind of start probably that there should be that we need to increase their salary i mean that should be definitely how do we do it there could be a brainstorming about it like dr jayaram said that uh nurses should uh, we need to have more revenue coming out of the nursing services mm-hmm. now that can happen in you know in lot of places they don't allow uh, if you put something as a nursing charge that is not allowed so in that case you see nursing is a part of the medical uh, services actually which are being delivered so it could be a part of the entire uh, uh, payout to the uh, medical professional whether it is the doctors or something nurses are a part of it you can increase that and make it somewhere that uh, how do we give more to the nurses does it become a part of the uh, medical professionals do we like ajita is suggesting if government like you know that farmers are suggesting minimum support profits for the farmers uh, for something i am saying 
here the minimum support price for at least uh, nurses and you can come out at least for accredited institutions the nurses who are coming out of good institution we need to kind of support them with uh, a minimum kind of a price as well as with the career uh, i would say opportunities to see that they grow and also to definitely i think their curriculum needs probably a huge amount of change so that they are job ready when they come out you yeah. see at the moment majority of the people will feel when these nurses come out like dr sajan also said mm -hmm. that is initial part uh, you know they don't know anything but i am saying that why should somebody be wasting their five years of their presence in a nursing school just like there is a there is a kind of a aura about a medical college in a medical school you don't have that kind of an aura about a nursing school there needs to be a much more focus on what is being taught in those schools you need to kind of give more emphasis to even training them on technology issues on communication issues and on leadership issues financial issues so that they are able to even converse on different topics and subjects and as i said a intellectual asymmetry has to bridge if they want a kind of a very uh, i would say a parallel kind of a presence in the healthcare ecosystem i get that thank you. yeah dr vita um first and foremost i want to thank my fellow panelists there's been so much wisdom that's been shared and i think all of us in this panel feel our nurses have to be better paid and we constantly struggle with that uh the other thing that i have also learned is apart from salary uh the other perks that you give them in terms of getting them to be faculty representing the organization at workshops sending them for conferences to present papers encourage them to participate in research projects i found that these are things that that nurses enjoy and that's part of the package you know of of the salary so your 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 building up not just self esteem but respect and confidence uh but certainly uh salaries we need to restructure and review this and if we together can find solutions for this it would it would be a huge difference for our nursing card yeah dr sanjeev you were saying something so uh, i think this is very uh, important what was what is being discussed uh, it is uh, it, it has to have a multifaceted approach so i think there would not be a solution everybody needs higher salary and that's a given that that is what is required now how do we tackle it within the constraint where healthcare cost is also rising we need to increase the revenue stream now somehow the gnm program which was uh, which was a very good program which suits indian environment was given a closure it has to restart and the indian nursing council has to really take it up second is like we run a nursing college we are given a seat of 40 to 60 and indian nursing council caps it at 100 if you don't have nursing in india why do you cap it at 100 i can run it for 250 seats because india requires it my hospital requires it it's a drop in ocean for me so the other thing is that if you talked about in your earlier question about non nursing responsibility so if there if some of it could be taken by anm some of it could be taken by ot scrubs uh, some of it could be taken by physician assistants there we have to look at a different ways of thinking which could be innovative rather than always bank on nursing and dependent they are not going to be available that's the given next 20 years there is nursing shortage in india they are not going to be available look at a better mechanism dr avita mentioned about just simple thing of providing accommodation and meals so it's not about just salary just giving a recognition providing accommodation meals giving a leadership position increasing seats working with the government restarting the gnm there are many other programs now no, no we have an msc program there are no takers why so there has to be a better way of readjusting the whole thing and there has to be a multifaceted 
solution they can uh, just increasing salary everybody wants it we also want to give them a decent salary but we'll have to fit uh, into an existing budget which sorts of works all and not bill patient extra i get that dr dr jairam right <clears throat> i'm going back to the issue of training uh, over here and what i'd like to bring across is that the standards of nursing education in this country are very varied <clears throat> we have sanjeev for example who spoke about his nursing school which may and like cmc would have extremely high standards of education and the quality of nursing product people coming out of such schools would be fantastic but that is not the case with all nursing schools in this country i therefore make a claim for independent training programs and this particularly online because this enables the nurse during her free time to mm -hmm. take these courses and upskill herself it was with this idea that we along a few of us started a online platform called anastomos which enables training and development of all healthcare professionals nursing including and one of the areas that is a key focus is soft skills because soft skills gives them a personality enhancement and their ability to interact with physicians and others in a hospital improves so an online program obviously at low cost which is affordable to the nurses is what i would say is a good solution to improve the quality of education of nurses in our country brilliant thank thanks dr jairam and we spoke about it's not just about salary i think there's a lot more which is possible you talk about something as simple as the quality of accommodation for that matter you talk about they say you know i'm just saying participation in conferences different learning events the recognition we spoke about task allocation across different kind of nurses dr jairam spoke about how do we make the contribution of nursing in the mm -hmm. context of revenue a lot more uh, visible for that matter mm -hmm. they're not just out there you know i mean they do they contribute to revenue i think they do contribute to revenue i think there's a lot which needs to be done to get that visibility i think that's important we spoke about let's say the quality of fresh nurses and to that extent the amount of investment we need to be made to make them productive so i think there are quite a few issues but i think the good thing is that there is a degree of uh, very clear awareness that there is something which needs to be done and i think what we spoke about is there is no one answer but it has to be addressed or tackled at, at very different levels for that matter i think that's a very encouraging thing now moving forward in fact uh, dr dr vijay said that every year you get 10 or 12 physicians getting getting padma shri or padma bhushan for that matter what happened to nurses but but just putting the thought in a very different context how come we don't see nursing uh, enough nursing leaders in the country or nurses senior nurses uh, taking overall managerial positions how is it that we just don't have people from nursing background heading a particular unit or heading a particular department or heading a particular hospital i mean is is are we investing or should we be investing in in making nurses leaders and i'm not just i'm not just nursing leaders a lot need to be done there but leaders in a broader context is that an opportunity is that a possibility which we are missing and is that something which needs to be addressed something should be done about it so let me dr vijay well see uh, i must say that uh, at max when we started uh, i think there was a reasonable amount of emphasis on lot of things that we talked about right from giving them a decent accommodation uh, emphasizing on their grooming giving them different roles and in fact two of the very uh, well renowned nursing leaders today including colonel binu and uh, madam usha benerji i had the pleasure of kind of working with them and they are now today uh, you know heading i would say multi hospital units as a group nursing directors 
Now, some of the uh, our Madam Gracie Mathai is now a CEO of a hospital in Baby Memorial. I think somewhere again and again, the emphasis has to be also in uh, developing and catching these such kind of people. So there is probably there is enough room, they say, at the top. But again, this top has to be compared with the top of the uh, on the other side. So that is where, and that again, there is an asymmetry, I would say, between the nursing profession and the legal profession, for example, today. Uh, I don't think amongst the top 100 uh, income taxpayers, there may be any doctor. You know, whatever even the top doctor may be earning has not even an iota of what, let us say, a doctor, Mr. Harish Salve or a <laughs> Kapil Sibbal or somebody may be earning. What he is earning for three days would be the entire earning of even Dr. Trehan, I can tell you. <laughs> so there is an asymmetry. And that asymmetry keeps percolating. The thing is that we are not, we are not in the habit of sharing the whenever somebody is giving accolades or there is a good outcome, we have not learned to include nursing or uh, as a group, we don't go and say that, look, for your outcome, it was this lady who was responsible, not me. See, the thing is that that is where uh, it comes. Yes, behind the scene, I'll say, yes, madam, you did very well. That's why I'm saying there's a lot of lip sympathy that goes on. But internally, we have to understand, uh, and somewhere along the line, I'm saying the nurses have to also elevate their level of functioning, their level of thinking, their level of even conversation. Today, for example, you go into a hotel, and you can see a difference between somebody when you walk in and somebody just says, hello, sir, even a housekeeping person may say, sir, how was your day? And you, here you may pass into a, this thing and a, a nurse may be going without any acknowledgement, no nothing, no smile. She will come into the room and, for example, put a thermometer in your mouth and, you know, she will record certain thing and go out and not say that, yeah, Mr. Verma, how are you, etc., etc. So there is a, like I think what Sanjeev said, it is a multifactorial thing, but I think it should also be done to change the public perception of nursing profession will be somewhere, I think, a last thing that will happen. I can tell you it's not easy because it will require naturally more public recognition. It will require uh, better compensation to them. It will require at least, I'll say that what the physician leaders can do is at least to start acknowledging them whenever there is a success, whether it is a happy delivery or a, a good laparoscopic surgery that has been done, I think that the physician leader or the surgeon leader needs to take his nurses along with him to share those good moments. That's all I can say. And I think Dr. Vijay, it's such a valid observation. Mm -hmm. I think almost every day in newspapers, you will find some press release from some hospital why a miracle was done and how a miracle was done. And you'll have a group photograph with eight or 10 people. The only person who would always be missing would be a nurse. Mm -hmm. I'm, or let's say, if I may correct, almost always. So I think I think that that recognition of their contribution to medical outcome, I think something which, which certainly needs to be I mean, can be corrected. I don't think that's a very difficult... It requires a whole lot of, let's say, encouragement, nudge or push for that matter. But yeah, you were saying something, Dr. Vita. Uh, no, I um, thank you so much for saying this, Dr. Vijay, because one of the things we realized, we had actually started a series of profiling our neonatal nurses, you know, just, just getting them to talk. Why did they become a nurse? Why did they choose neonatal nursing? What was the high point? And this was put on to our YouTube channel. And it was the highest, um, you know, that attracted a lot of interest. And it was not just by other nurses, but mothers, you know, women were listening to this. And I think you're right. That was a huge learning for us as an organization. 
what a difference it makes. And we need to acknowledge our nurses. Uh, that's, that's just one small step we had taken and it paid dividends. Yes. Making them publicly. I, I just wanted to share a personal moment. My wife, unfortunately, had a biliary sludge and she got a ERCP done. She had a post-ERCP pancreatitis, was admitted for almost six months in a critical care setting with multiple uh, complications. The only thing what we remember out of that tragic thing, there were 16 post-ERCP pancreatitis came in. All of them succumbed. They all died. She somehow survived with a pericardial effusion, pleural effusion, burst abdomen, paracolic abscesses. But there were these nurses who used to take time. Her peripheral veins were all collapsed. She had only one intrajugular vein left. But whatever in this tragedy, what we remember is those nurses who just used to give time, almost three to four hours to find one small vein on her scalp because she ha she is nil orally, she is on a jejunostomy, the everything uh, sort of needs to go on. But then what do you do? Just almost half an hour to one hour talking to her because she was depressed. She didn't know that she would survive, combing her hair. And we know all of them. We know all of them by names. And we don't want to remember that episode in our life. But we know these nursing staff who just took care of her. And possibly because of her, we, we, she survived. So they are superb uh, healthcare professionals who really make a large difference. And Thank I think you, Sanjeev, for sharing that. Thank you. Those nurses deserve that recognition. Thank you. And I think, Sanjeev, what we are talking about, what Dr. Vijay said that, or Dr. Vita gave the example of neonatal nurses for that matter, I think their contribution being made public, being talked to others, being shared with others, you can imagine how much encouragement it gives them. And I think, I think otherwise, they're just pushed to the background. See, when Dr. Jairam spoke about that when you look at their compensation, do we realize their contribution? I think if their contribution on various platforms, or on various counts, if that starts getting more and more visible, that I'm not half as good without them, I think that itself creates a mood, if I may say, to look at, look at their compensation, you know, what they're getting a little differently. But I have a very pointed question to you, Sanjeev and Dr. Sajjan that among the 10 or 12 bright sparks you may have in nursing, Sanjeev, and the same question to Sajjan, do you see a couple of them heading a function or heading a small unit or a hospital at some point of time? And if yes, what is it you're doing about it? Or what is it which, which can be done about it? So absolutely the answer is yes, because they are just phenomenal. They are fantastic managers. They have dealt with dietary. They have dealt with all difficult clinical team. They have dealt with mechanical engineers. They have dealt with uh, gas pipeline system. They have dealt with uh, very difficult pharmacy group. They have dealt with bad uh, patients. So they they dealt with everything. And they also go back home and they deal with their family. Sure. And it is, so they are superb human beings. So I don't know how do they do on a day in and day out basis, but they do fantastic work. So what we are trying to do, we have other than the two large hospitals, there are other small hospitals, which are 30 to 100 beds, which are mostly free of cost palliatives and tribal uh, homes, uh, hospice homes and tribal hospitals. And many uh, senior nursing staff are there and they are Fortunately for us, they are devotees, so they take up that low role. There is a leadership program which is also run uh, for them. And uh, there is large bit of uh, this whole management thing because we have a management school. They go through that. So my answer is yes, they are there. They just need to be sort of empowered, given that role, and they, they um, play that role phenomenally well. And we just need to sort of keep encouraging them. Yeah, thank you. And you said that there is nothing they don't deal with and they probably deal with the most difficult situations. Sajjan. Yeah. Yes, sir. before coming to that, uh, I really appreciate Dr. Vijay with the topic of earning of a doctor against a lawyer. But Dr. Vijay, they are not told to charge 500 rupees per consultation or 
two thousand rupees per case. So unfortunately, we are the one who are facing the brunt of getting under regulations of money. Second point on those uh, nursing, uh, I think uh, after inspiration from you only, we started the campaign front half page advertisement about our nursing and how they bring in the difference. I think in Gujarat, all the seven uh, five major newspapers carried it as a half page advertisement of our nurses only with all their photographs. And uh, that has, and that is not on a nursing day. That is in the month of February. So <laughs> we started the program. So uh, as regards whether we have some nurses, yes, our two HR nurses will sooner or later head the HR function at one of our hospitals. That's one is. Uh, there is one more leader who is evolving and to be operations manager. She okay. is hands on. She understands things. We have sent her for two three courses also. So these three happening things are happening. More importantly, uh, my nurse lead, she is very positive and she definitely puts her foot down when it comes to a lot of things. So that actually makes a difference in the hospital. Finally, a good thing about which I thought I would share with you is in Ahmedabad, we are talking about all these things. Uh, we have got now nurses as entrepreneurs also. We have got four nurses coming together to start a hospital, a small hospital, 50 bed, yes. where they are appointing the doctors and make sure that it runs well. <laughs> and, and I think Gujarat is the one which can happen all these things. And the sooner or later, if this, uh, this system works on, I, I think we, everything is going to be great for all, all of us, for the patients, for the nurses and everybody. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> that, that's real good news. That's real good news. Uh, may I come in uh, to say something? Please, uh, please, please Captain. Uh, so, uh, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Sajin. Uh, I think I should, uh, I mm. should visit that hospital. I mean, that's a fantastic idea. If, uh, yes. Uh, and I, I have heard of a hospital in Maharashtra, which was run by a midwife and uh, quite very famous. Uh, that was some time back. Uh, well, uh, to answer to your question, you know, I right now I am uh, heading a hospital as chief executive officer. But, uh, you know, in my experience of past, say, three, four years where I had been into operations, uh, is that uh, being a nurse, it is much more easier for me to handle. Let me tell you, even the doctors, even more, the senior most doctors, for me uh, to, uh, you know, connect with them is, I, I never thought it would be that, uh, you know, easier than somebody else who is, not from healthcare background otherwise, uh, you know, and also to deal with, uh, say, handle with care patients, this difficult patients are somebody, I mean, the moment they are, they feel that, you know, as a head of the hospital, you understand their feeling, uh, you know, it is very easy to connect with them. So uh, on, on, on a day-to-day -day life, uh, you know, handling people uh, for me is much easier than uh, you know, someone else, uh, you know, because I can connect with people much faster because all these things, what we had been discussing, I have gone through uh, for so many years. So that is one thing. And also I feel uh, if hospitals invest in nurses to be the ones who lead the hospitals, you know, it is all the more beneficial to the hospital. I mean, they have not been wise enough so far, I would, I would, if I may say that. Why? Because they do have understanding where this uh, you know, leakages happen and where is it hitting the revenue and by doing what you can control the expenses and, uh, you know, uh, probably, uh, uh, you know, where to increase the price, they, they may have to learn, but otherwise, uh, you know, where to control, whom to catch, uh, you know, it is so easy for them to understand the nitty gritties of healthcare and a uh, little bit of support in, in kind of maybe finance or something like that would make them great leaders. And uh, only problem what I uh, envisage is, you know, uh, they, uh, by virtue of their bringing up, nurses do suffer from, many of them suffer from this problem of accountability phobia, you know. Like, like you look at the nurses' eye and ask a question, they'll start trembling. That's because of the lack of support from the system. Uh, because the moment somebody is questioned, they are little worried about it that what would be the consequences so uh, if if you can turn around that they would be the best leaders uh, for a hospital they are uh, they are the uh, heads of quality in many hospitals today you know the a lot more differences has been brought in by accreditation and uh, and thankfully the accreditation structure in our country followed the jci way where they are equals 
you know uh, so you you never feel that you are uh, below the doctor when you sit in an accreditation uh, you know group of uh, assessors so uh, so and i was lucky enough to lead many of those things and i never felt that someone dealt with me badly uh, so uh, so they might have been careful in other way but whatever <laughs> so uh, what i feel is that uh, you know the, we have come a long way this is the right time uh, where there is an awareness of nurses potential across Uh, and nurses have become uh, you know sort of one step ahead of our predecessors where we start feeling bad for what we are uh, being treated at and started questioning the system that that's a good thing to happen many people may be a little bit upset about it but i'm sure they'll get used to it and they'll accommodate them and uh, you know uh, things look brighter provided we acknowledge the uh, the potential of the time uh, you know that is that is with the healthcare leaders in this country to acknowledge the time and you know give a little bit support to the nurses and in the long run it will help a long way in in uh, making the sustainability of private sector a reality i would say thank uh, you let me just uh, add i think uh, ajita the good point i think dr nair has when what he talked about some of the nurses becoming entrepreneurs is definitely like breaking another ceiling and i think from any and kaho let's try to nurture this particular thought process i think this is an excellent kind of a thing to say that how can we support any of the nurses who wish to take up this venture uh, i'm sure people like uh, ratan ji and all of us can provide them with the necessary inputs i think this is a fantastic thing that he broke the idea and i think that should be one of the game changers can be promoting nurses to be entrepreneurs yeah and we can even identify such examples let's say across the world and and, and broadcast about it mm. so, so now that we are coming to a i think we have had really good discussion but we are kind of coming to a close so let me ask one question to all of you and let me start with dr vita what is the single most important change you would like to see in the nursing profession Ratan, thank you. I would do everything in my power to make nursing aspirational, and to make it aspirational. What we've discussed this evening is what we have to implement. Acknowledge what they bring to the table, respect them as colleagues, invest in them in all aspects that we've discussed, and pay them salaries. that make them feel proud so if i have a responsibility today and listening to all my fellow panelists i want to make the nursing profession aspirational dr jeram i would say enhance the nursing profession's social position in the healthcare hierarchy by doing this you will create a greater confidence in that workforce and that itself will lead them to achieve greater bigger and better heights dr vijay yeah uh, our friends have already spoken two of the things so let me enter that as well as i'm concerned i'll like to focus on the nursing education so that uh, she becomes a more complete person she is uh, proud of herself she is a uh, well informed nurse job ready and i like to focus on changing the nursing education captain ajita finally uh if if i mean i i wouldn't say just one thing will change uh, the nursing profession i, I regard what uh, dr evita said uh, that uh, you know you know let the younger people look forward to become nurses this is only in kerala it happens of course let me let me say that too uh, here you know it is an aspirational thing in kerala because that is the only way to go abroad easy so not that way I, we, we don't mean that but uh, i mean that's not bad of course but uh, in in our country nurses are uh, when when you hear about a nurse or somebody come to know that you're a nurse so Uh, oh are you nurse and from that to oh i mean it it is oh okay you are a nurse so their response uh, to the nurse is something at that of a respectable uh, job is is what i would uh, i would uh, look forward to so that the younger ones will be 
thinking of coming to nurses so such bad experiences in your younger age uh, the, the the novice nurses undergo is what uh, you know make them run away from the country so we, we i mean uh, it is it is not too late but i would say if we delay it we are at, we will become at a tipping point where uh, you know healthcare will face a crisis where the clinical outcomes would be pretty bad if you don't look after nurses so uh, it is it is our need of the time that everybody come together and uh, you know look forward to taking care of our nurses and the way we look at it is is that uh, you know uh, as dr evita said you have to consider on the mass colleagues and not just you know uh, just orderlies uh, you know many of us need to change that uh, and uh, maybe a collective voice would Uh, open their mind and ears i would feel and uh, it, uh, the more we need to talk i mean the we will talk the more effect would be there so many more such discussions are required at the public platform thank you dr ratan for uh, making us all come together and talk about this it is uh, it, it is the need of the hour definitely no i'm with you sir i think thanks so much we speak about this is making the nursing profession aspiration we speak about reducing the the hierarchical inequalities the gaps we speak about at a fundamental level we need to address the quality of nursing education for that matter and make them a lot more job ready make them a lot more confident and and i think what dr jita i mean captain jita spoke about so i think uh, overall uh, i think uh, Uh, we have had a phenomenal panel i think people who are not just passionate but people who have done uh, enough if i may say or done a lot to push the envelope when it come to nursing they have actually set examples in uh, many different ways and and in in a limited time we could touch on various issues issues you know from they say the role they play which you know which is very muddled up we talked about subordination we talked about the need to invest in training we talked about leadership opportunities we spoke about entrepreneurial ship and you know some of the fundamental issues so all i can say that it's it's only the beginning and and this journey if i may say is going to be almost perpetual so in fact i look at it as an exercise which is which is going to be there all time to come and i think i think see the two thing which i i honestly wish and pray that we should maintain optimism that's one and two is the more and more actionable insights we have and we are able to share with others that this is what is possible this is what has been done it could be something as simple as dr vita talking about how do we showcase the neonatal nurses for that matter is a very simple example but is that something which can be done by any hospital any time the answer is yes will it make a difference yes we talked about nursing leadership in fact dr sajan said the why can't you have one or two bright nurses in your hr for that matter so i think as long as we have some very very uh, simple examples of what has been done and the kind of results it has produced and and which gives others if i may say some thoughts some ideas some insights about if, if this is what is possible let's take one more step or let's take two more steps i think that itself would be a, will hopefully set up some momentum to for the change to start happening so i must thank all of you for finding time and and sharing your views so so emphatically in such a candid fashion before you conclude i just had one <laughs> more idea just now and i thought that i can share you know at one time the lawyers uh, were again uh, you know had the same reputation of that anybody who did not have any thing to do was to do an llb and all that and majority of them were not even practicing but the emergence of the national law schools oh, correct the national law school in bangalore and all that changed that entire face of the legal profession same way i feel somewhere if you can think of starting a college of nursing leaders maybe where you know you are trying to say that uh, you are looking at a, a group of nurses who may become uh, to change i would say the perception of the nursing think about it because people like dr nandram <laughs> dr nankumar jaram is here he has the access to the 
kind of people who can listen to such uh, funny ideas that I am coming so out I, with, but so, feel that think so about. Dr. So, Doctor Vijay, I have had some conversations, let's say even at ISB and otherwise. And let me do one thing. Now that you have said, I would come back to you, and I think. Uh, given Kaho's mindset, Kaho's inclination, I think there's a lot which we can yes. drive even from Kaho with that matter. But, oh, absolutely. but absolutely. I, think, I think a lot to be done. And uh, and thank you once again. And I must thank all the all the participants. We have had almost 70, 75. And I think for joining and, and we sincerely hope that the discussion uh, has been helpful. Thanks once again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ratan. Thank you very much. Yeah.